realized the moment I fell into the fissure that the book would not be destroyed as I had planned. It continued falling into that starry expanse of which I had only a fleeting glimpse. I've tried to speculate where it might have landed. I must admit, however, such conjecture is futile. Still, questions about whose hands might one day hold my mystery are unsettling to me. I know my apprehensions might never be allayed, and so I close, realizing that perhaps the ending has not yet been written. Atris's apprehension is based in the unknown. The player. The stranger. The player behind the computer monitor has a peculiar interaction with Atris in Mist, only interacting with him after the opening scene through reading his journals and visiting the worlds he created. They don't meet face to face until the game's final scene. But paradoxically, though Atris is the most important character in Mist, the man responsible for the worlds in which the narrative takes place, the one present in every sense except physical for the entirety of the game, his existence is enigmatic. Though the player is constantly surrounded by Atris's work, they are at the same time solitary, made to find their way through the worlds of Mist using their own abilities to solve puzzles and navigate unfamiliar worlds. It is this theme of paradoxical solitude that defines Mist, as it builds up the mysterious atmosphere and story which push the game into becoming one of the most important artistic and rhetorical works in gaming history. Though Mist was a critically and financially successful work, it is loaded with jargon and terms that the uninitiated is not going to know, so I take it upon myself to teach them to you right now. The principal human character of Mist is Atris, who is a member of the Dini people, a race of humans in the game's fiction with the ability to write parallel universes into existence through a writing technique called the arts, which uh, I don't think that term actually comes up in the original game, but it develops over time. The worlds created are known as ages. They are created in these books known as descriptive books, and one can move between the ages via the use of linking books, which are kind of the principal uh, thing that you need to find in the game. Uh, the central plot of Mist involves the player finding the final page to a linking book that they must deliver to Atris, who is stuck on an island called Kavir, trapped apart from everyone else with an incomplete linking book back to Mist Island, from which he'll be able to travel to the other ages uh, so that he and the player may return to their respective homes. Before I get started, I also have to introduce another term to everybody, and that is re yeah. rhetoric. There are a number of different ways to define the word rhetoric. I will be using uh, this description from Sonia K. Foss's work, Rhetorical Criticism, 5th edition, um, which is the human use of symbols to communicate that is threefold. There is humans, there are symbols which are used to communicate. I know that seems very nitpicky, but there's a whole bunch of discussion about what rhetoric is, and everybody defines it differently, so I'm going to be defining it by uh, uh, old Sonia's definition for the purpose of this video. Writing is central to the plot of the Myst games. Entire worlds upon which entire civilizations are built become manifest because of Atris's writing. As shown in Atris's journals, which one can read in the library on Mist Island, Atris is intensely dedicated and thoughtful with regards to how he writes ages into existence. He fully understands the power that his writing holds. While excellence and beauty can come from his writings, just as much suffering and violence may arise through the worlds his writing creates. This theme where writing is used to create suffering, intentionally or not, reflects French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss's chapter A Writing Lesson in the collection Tris Tropiques, or Sad Tropics, a seminal work of structuralism. Structuralism was a philosophical movement in 20th century France which focused on understanding human thought through societal structures. A writing lesson has Lévi-Strauss describing his experience as a society he studies, the Namaquara of South America, interacts with writing for the first time. A member of the Namaquara sees him taking notes and imitates him with a makeshift pencil and paper of his own. 
The man does not write anything, actually merely imitating Levi Strauss's actions, but he uses it in an attempt to gain some sort of power and attention among his community. Levi Strauss seeing the symbolic importance of writing even to a culture that doesn't use it prompts him to consider the destructive power of writing. Stating infamously, writing seems to have favored the exploitation of human beings rather than their enlightenment. He finds examples such as the chattel slavery system of the colonial era, where the societal structures that facilitated inhumane atrocities were only feasible because of the archival, educational, and cataloging ability that writing provides. He uses this to conclude that writing primarily facilitates two things, oppression and alienation. Now, levi strauss work, much like the work of any mid-20th century anthropologist, or any anthropologist at all, or any French person who wrote anything in the two decades after World War II, or any French person who wrote anything in the decade after 1968, or any French person at any point, has aged significantly, and you've got to take it with a pretty significant grain of salt. But I do see where it comes from here. Writing allows for a level of complexity via education, abstract consideration, historical documentation, etc., which can be used to both achieve great heights and incredible lows. His interpretation is very cynical, but again, I get it. At any point, the toothpaste is out of the tube. We've had the highs and lows which the written word has allowed for us. And when I was first reading a writing lesson, I couldn't help but feel echoes of the story of Mist. In Mist, the player experiences a society's oppressive and alienating experience with writing at the opposite end of its history. While a writing lesson takes place when the Nambaquara society first encounters the symbolic power of writing, Mist's narrative takes place after the rise, fall, and overall destruction of the societies within the ages. In this way, Mist acts as a fulfillment of levi strauss structuralist prophecy. Writing, while it provided the structures for the societies within the ages to exist, also provided the structure for a disastrous societal collapse. This oppression and alienation, which levi strauss says comes at the end of the experience with writing, is shown through rhetorical techniques of communication that crop up during a player's experience in Mist. Mist communicates the idea of societal oppression through physical artifacts left in the ages. One example of this comes through the player's experience navigating the Channelwood Age. In the bedroom of Akinar, Atris's older son, and one of the two rulers of the Channelwood Age with his brother Cirrus, there rests several instruments of oppression, spiked maces, chains, and an electrified metal cage. These items act as symbols that communicate how Akinar manipulated the societies created by his father's writing in order to be an oppressive force. Akinar's bedrooms in other ages communicate this idea as well. His room in the Stone Ship Age features a sculpture made out of a human rib cage, communicating his barbarism. His room in the Channelwood Age features a stockpile of spears leaned up against a wall, communicating his fascination with violence. And a temple in the Channelwood Age features a holographic screen he used to make orders to the Channelwood people, showing his despotism. The variety of physical artifacts used by Akinar to oppress the people of the world created by his father's writing communicates an idea which heavily reflects Levi Strauss declaration that writing's primary outcome is societal oppression. Societal alienation, brought on by writing, is reflected in the journals of Atris in the library on Mist Island, shown through the discrepancy between the lived experience of the player and the written experience of Atris. For the most part, Atris's journals come at the societal beginnings of each age, detailing his first experiences there. Atris comes off as mostly optimistic when he tells the stories of the people of his ages. His rhetoric reflects ideas of pride and admiration. Take, for example, the final sentence of his journal on the Mechanical Age. Though the sky may always be black, I am confident the people here feel a heavier darkness has been lifted from their shoulders. This optimism for the Age's people, once the player visits the Mechanical Age, sees the evidence of Cirrus and Akinar's tyranny, and feels the emptiness of an age long devoid of people, creates an ironic discrepancy between expectation and reality. This disconnect appeals to pathos for the player, communicating sympathy for the lost society of lively inhabitants so admired by Atris. The journals make the player desire to experience the culture of the Ages, particularly if they read the journals before they actually make the trip. But the experience navigating the ages communicates the player's overall impotence in the scheme of the narrative, as they can do nothing to return the society described in Atris's journals. This discrepancy communicates the alienation of the player, bringing into question their relevance to the story of Mist altogether. 
If Atris's journal writings were not available to the player, the emotional experience communicated by navigating the ages would likely just be one of mystery and enigma. However, the rhetorical decision by the Miller brothers to give the player an understanding of what the ages once were amends what emotion is communicated to include a sense of loss, melancholy, and powerlessness. The Levi-Straussian ideas of societal oppression and alienation brought on by writing that were reflected in Mist serve to push forward Mist's overarching theme of solitude. The history communicated in both the presence of physical artifacts and Atris's archival work gives the player the understanding that there was at one point a living, breathing society on the ages, filled with people who dealt with emotions like hope, joy, and suffering. There were stories made, atrocities committed, and artifacts created. However, the player experiences none of that, only grasping at knowing about the histories of Mist's ages through these rhetorical artifacts. As the player navigates through the worlds, they are forced to understand their own isolation, with their position as a solitary foreigner who can never be fully anything more than an observer in a world which no longer thrives. The presence of writing as the cause of all of these emotions reflects structuralism. Though none of this oppression or alienation was intended by the structure's writer, People ended up being oppressed, and the player ended up being alienated, much in the same way that these frustrations to Levi Strauss are inevitable results of writing's existence in society. Mist also uses spatial rhetorical strategies to communicate the player's isolation. I'm defining space here as multifold. There's the architectural construction of the spaces one travels in, and the atmospheric spaces created by aesthetic choices like the auditory production. Both of these, among other things, create a sense of space within which one lives and exists. Spatial rhetoric, therefore, I'm defining as any instance wherein these spatial decisions on the part of the designer communicates something to the player. One spatial aspect which communicates solitude is the proliferation of spaces only amenable to a single person, which are basically omnipresent throughout the game. Though the ages in this game were all at some point in the history of the narratives, home to small societies, there is a paradoxical singularity to the paths which the player takes while navigating these worlds. For example, though the forest on Mist Island is relatively widespread, there is only one roped-off, defined path to take from the front of the library down to the island shore, wide enough only to accommodate one person. This is a common spatial theme throughout the game. The boardwalk paths in the Channelwood Age are only wide enough for a single person, surrounded by water. The observatory on Mist Island has only the single chair. The corridors in the fortress in the Mechanical Age are very narrow, with high-rising, dark gray, diamond-cut metallic walls and checkerboard tile floors, giving the experience of moving from room to room a feeling of claustrophobia. The stairway moving down to the room at the bottom of the ship in the Channelwood Age is similar, forcing the player to be surrounded by beige stone, completely overcome by the construction of the ship. These spaces meant only for a single person reflect the theme of solitude, as it communicates how untenable the situation would be were there more than just a single player navigating the world. The player is faced with the fact that there are no others to help them, and that this game requires them to be alone. Another instance of this is in the atmospheric space evoked on Mist Island. The player begins their experience in Mist on the island, and though they are alone and unfamiliar with the environment, the atmosphere of the island which surrounds them is relatively pleasant. The audio, when outdoors, consists of cheerful, calm noises. Leaves rustle, gentle waves roll into the cliffs which surround the island. The weather which surrounds the player is pleasing as well. The sky is bright, the water around the island is blue, and the trees and grass are a healthy green. The primary buildings on the island, such as the library and observatory, are well lit and inviting, and entering them prompts positive collegial musical accompaniment. In contrast, the other ages are far more dreary and pessimistic in atmosphere. Dense fog covers the Selenitic and Stoneship Ages. The trees of the Channelwood Age are towering and thin, with only a few clumps of green foliage visible to the player, contrasted with the healthy pines of Mist Island. The water in the Stoneship and Mechanical Ages is a cloudy gray color. The music in each age is far more metallic and threatening, particularly whenever the player enters the bedroom of Cirrus or Achenar.
The incongruity here between the pleasance of Mist Island and the dreariness of the other ages reinforces the idea that the player is alone. While the island, which acts as a hub between ages where the player spends the bulk of their time, begins to feel like a sort of home, the other ages, by contrast, become more intimidating and treacherous. It becomes clear through these atmospheric effects that when the player leaves the comfort of Mist Island, they become an unwelcome presence, intruding on a world that does not belong to them. Another partially spatial aspect here, I know I'm kind of fudging this, comes from the artifacts of communication which the player can find around the worlds of Mist. Outside of the brief interactions with Cirrus and Akinar through the books in which they were imprisoned in the library on Mist Island, the player is not directly communicated to through the bulk of Mist. However, there are small artifacts of communication between characters throughout the game. There is the evidence of communication between Cirrus and Akinar on both the Mechanical and Channelwood Ages, for example. A note addressed from Akinar to Cirrus, found in Cirrus's bedroom on the Mechanical Age, serves as an admonishment about Cirrus's greed. This reflects the characterization of Cirrus, that he is haughty and opulent, that one can glean from seeing the highly ornate dressings of his bedrooms. There's also a hologram message from Cirrus to Akinar on Channelwood, wherein Cirrus warns Akinar about Atris's plan to imprison them. Also on Channelwood, there are hologram speeches from Atris to the citizens of the Channelwood Age. On Mist Island, there are artifacts of communication from Atris to Catherine, his wife and the mother of the two sons. Uh, one note from Atris to Catherine, which is likely the first interaction the player has with any of these things because of its proximity to where the player stands at the beginning of the game, explains that there's a hologram message for her in the four chamber underneath the island. Uh, in this hologram message, Atris explains effectively why the linking books are locked away and why much of the library is burnt. The player takes information from each of these pieces of communication, and three of the messages, the hologram from Cirrus to Akinar and the messages from Atris to Catherine, are indispensable for solving critical puzzles in order to progress. Despite these messages' importance for characterization, atmosphere creation, and puzzle-solving purposes, the player is irrelevant to their existence. Since they are so few and far between, the player latches on to these small scraps of character-to-character -character interaction. The contradictory nature of these messages' relation to the player, invaluable to them, but unaware of them, communicates the theme of solitude by highlighting the player's overall alien nature to the world around them. Aspects of digital rhetoric like realistic imagery, atmospheric audio, and the first-person point of view are used to highlight the player's singular role within the game. Mist acts as a very early example of virtual reality. The attempt to place players as the active character inside of a game rather than having them act as one controlling a character within the game. Unlike many other popular computer games of 1993, such as Sam and Max Hit the Road and Maniac Mansion 2 Day of the Tentacle, which had the player control unique characters with their own personalities and tendencies, Mist effectively erased the role of a main character, which the player controlled. In other games, characters described what happens in front of them, giving the player the story through dialogue and narration. In Mist, the player behind the keyboard and the character moving around in the ages are one, leaving them with nobody to describe or narrate, thus putting the burden of understanding on the player themselves. This changes the way that the player experiences the game, subverting the expectations of the time. The creation of a virtual reality within which the player exists pushes them to consider their own solitude through the absence of a true main character. This is rhetorical, as the virtual reality acts as yet another way in which the sense of solitude is communicated. While lifelike first-person perspectives are quite common in modern popular games, and the virtual reality experiences are widely available through services like Oculus and PlayStation VR, the computer gaming scene had very little experience with an experience which grasped at virtual reality in the way that Myst did upon its arrival. Literature of the time reflects this. A 1993 review of Myst in the New York Times by Edward Rothstein used the game as a jumping off point from which to discuss the idea of video games as a legitimate form of art. This was something unheard of during a time when video games were marketed towards and typically considered the realm of children. Rothstein praises the game's use of photorealistic imagery and atmospherically pleasing audio, ultimately defining the game as something which surpasses genre by saying, Myst seems to define a new genre in which the film does not exist without the player who brings it to life. Myst seems to reflect the condition of the video game itself, poised at the brink of something new even before it has finished mastering something old. A 1994 review of Myst in the magazine Wired by John Carroll reflects this same sort of wonder, describing the game with emotions which were atypical in that era of gaming. Myst was beautiful, complicated, emotional, dark, intelligent, absorbing. 
It was the only thing like itself. It had invented its own category. The reviews from Rothstein and Carroll focus on the game's atmospheric aspects more so than they focus on the plot or puzzles upon which the game is built. Rothstein discusses the game's cinematic approach to storytelling, and Carroll goes in-depth on which of the game's sound effects are his favorites. Both reviewers speak about the potentially progressive steps in game design presented by the CD-ROM, a new technology at the time, one which allowed for video clips, high-quality images, and realistic audio clips to be used in games. Virtual reality presentation was both something unexpected in the discipline of computer gaming and something heavily affecting to players of the time. This historical and contextual understanding of Myst's successful use of the rhetorical technique of virtual reality creation further shows how well Myst functioned rhetorically. In the history of gaming, Myst is important for a slew of reasons. As the foundation of a narrative, it is important because it spawned four sequels and three different spiritual successors, launching Cyan Worlds into continued relevance 25 years after the first game's launch. In a capitalistic sense, it was important because it was the highest selling computer game of the 1990s, a decade which also saw the release of other culturally important games such as The Seventh Guest, SimCity, and Doom. In a gaming sense, it influenced a series of similarly atmospheric puzzle-based adventure games like Schism, The Journeyman Project, and Siberia. But in a rhetorical sense, Myst should be appreciated as an incredibly effective work in communicating solitude towards its player. Nearly every rhetorical aspect of the game, from the age design to the interactions between characters to the way the game is experienced itself, work towards crafting an overall theme. The player is alone, alienated in an oppressive world created at the hand of an unknown. Riven, the sequel to Myst, saw release in 1997, and it expands on many of the themes of the original game. However, never again would the player in the Myst series feel quite so alien. Future games in the series were rife with interactions between the players and their allies and enemies. Even in the series spawned by the game which mastered Solitude, the rhetorical theme had diminished significantly. However, 25 years later, with the proliferation of all these new virtual reality platforms, there is a gap that could be filled by a new generation's mist. With the culture prompted to feel a sense of alienation and solitude by so many different forms of media, social media platforms which simulate expression and connection without presenting the full thing, uh, entertainment media producers shrinking media communities by inching closer and closer to a monopolistic media oligarchy, and political media emphasizing the importance of self-sufficiency over the importance of a community, the zeitgeist seems to be in the precise place where an experience like Myst could shove a sense of cultural solitude directly forward. The success of media which engages with technology's relationship to solitude, such as the television series Black Mirror and the film Ingrid Goes West, shows that modern media culture is ready. The next virtual reality producer to strive for a work which highlights solitude can look to Myst as a sort of roadmap something to map modern sensibilities on in order to communicate it. Gaming, virtual reality, and culture are always changing. And at a particularly alienated moment in cultural history, Myst presents something valuable from which we can learn. Perhaps the ending to Myst's cultural moment has not yet been written. Ooh.